All right, let us continue with our lecture on the electroweak standard model. The last time we started with discussing three generations of fermions of quarks and leptons, and we focused in particular on the CKM matrix, which governs the mixing and the transitions between the different generations. And today we come to a different topic, namely CP violation. CP violation is an important uh, property of the standard model, which is also tested experimentally. And uh, CP is violated by a small extent. However, it is observable in a particular set of processes. And we will uh, look at what processes these are. CP violation is also described by the standard model. And the description has to do with the CKM matrix. Therefore, this fits into the overall topic of three generations of quarks and leptons. And we will see today where the connection comes from. Let me first uh, define what CP violation is and how we can see whether the standard model is invariant under CP or not. For this, we work in gauge eigenstates. So at the moment, we do not yet use those mass eigenstates for the quark fields that we introduced the last time. And uh, so let me just give you a property without proof in quantum field theory. CP transformations, first of all, can be implemented in a certain way by transforming the fields. Basically, you know that in every quantum field, there is a creation operator for antiparticles and annihilation operators for particles. Therefore, a CP transformation basically has to do with exchanging those creation and annihilation operators for the particles and the respective antiparticles. Therefore, it is clearly connected to simply replacing a field by its Hermitian adjoint operator, because then you exchange the roles of A and B dagger, let's say. And uh, precisely speaking, you can define CP transformations in the following. And uh, the definition has an ambiguity because in principle, uh, the creation and annihilation operators are not unambiguously defined. You could redefine them by complex phases without changing their physical content. And therefore, the following transformations for CP also involve some arbitrary phases. So uh, as follows, up to complex phases. Namely, uh, there would be a CP operator, a CP that stands for an operator which acts on the operators like quantum field operators. And then you have here, for example, a fermion field psi, CP to the minus one would be given by I gamma two times psi bar transpose. So this corresponds to the CP conjugation of a fermion field. Um, there are these Weyl fermions where you can use the Weyl notation with uh, alpha and alpha dot spinors. So then you can decompose a four spinor psi alpha chi bar alpha dot with the same CP transformation. Uh, looks a little bit nicer than with this I gamma two because it simply corresponds to exchanging the role of the two parts of the Weyl spinors. So this is maybe easier to memorize, and it looks a little bit more beautiful than the transformation of the full Dirac spinor. So for a scalar field phi, like the Higgs field, uh, there is uh, the simplest transformation. Phi simply goes to phi decker. And for a vector field, Um, it transforms into itself times a parity transformation matrix, which basically means 
that uh, the space components of the vector field get a minus and the time component gets a plus in this transformation. That simply corresponds to space reflection and uh, the overall field operator transforms like this. And then, for example, if you have such a combination which typically appears in the Lagrangian psi bar gamma mu p left psi and you transform the overall combination. So that would be something that uh, appears in the kinetic terms and in the interactions between quarks, leptons and gauge bosons in the standard model, of course. Then this entire combination transforms uh, as follows, namely it transforms into minus p mu nu times psi bar gamma nu p lift psi. And then given this, you can see how to construct CP invariant Lagrangians. So therefore, in particular, one thing is easy to see if you look at the typical uh, Lagrangians of a gauge theory like the standard model, then the gauge kinetic and uh, matter kinetic terms they are completely composed out of either vector fields and their derivatives or out of such objects coupled to vector fields. And then automatically they are always invariant under CP. So there is no way that those Lagrangians violate CP. So they are always CP invariant no matter how the phases are chosen. So that is an important statement. You cannot get CP violation from any of those terms in the Lagrangian. Good. Now let us investigate how we can get CP violation. So uh, the terms which are not listed here are on the one hand the Higgs potential term that might or might not violate CP and the Yukawa interaction between the Higgs and the fermions that might or might not violate CP. Let us look at both of them. First, the Higgs potential. which is mu square phi square minus lambda phi to the fourth. And uh, here you see what happens if you replace phi by phi dagger, even if you, so that is correct up to some phase, but no matter what phase you choose, if you replace phi by phi dagger times any phase, this is automatically invariant and also that is automatically invariant. Therefore, this Lagrangian also conserves CP. So, and you see here maybe that you can identify some possibilities for extensions of the standard model to violate CP. In extensions of the standard model, the Higgs potential might be different. And how would the term look like that has at least a chance of violating CP? It would have to be a term which does not simply contain phi absolute value square. And in principle, there might be such terms which do not only contain phi absolute value square, but uh, products of different Higgs fields without uh, an absolute value square. I mean, why shouldn't that appear? And so in the two Higgs doublet model, for example, you could write down products of two different Higgs fields without the absolute value, which nevertheless are real and therefore can appear in the potential. And then you have the possibility of violating CP with the Higgs potential, but not in the standard model. So then what remains is the Yukawa term. 
and that can violate CP. But CP can be violated by the Yukawa term. And so therefore, let us now focus on the Yukawa interactions. And they, of course, contain the three generations of quarks and leptons. And as we will see at the end, um, in fact, it violates CP only if there are at least three generations of quarks and leptons, which is also quite fascinating um, discovery. So from our previous section, 2.1, we had obtained a certain form of the Yukawa interaction, L Yukawa can be written in terms of those interaction eigenstates without loss of generality in terms of diagonalized Yukawa couplings where only the CKM matrix appears as one non-diagonal object in the three generations. And so let me write it like this, minus Ye ij times L left i bar phi br J for the leptons, so this would be a Yukawa term for the leptons, and here the Ye without prime is diagonal in the generations, so only diagonal elements here are non-zero. I will write this down in a second, or oh, maybe no. So Ye, D, U, they are diagonal, and without loss of generality, the diagonal entries are non-negative real numbers. Okay, then how does it go on? We have the same thing for the down quarks. Why? And here in the down quarks, we uh, have the CKM matrix. So we have the product V times YD as a matrix with indices IJ. And even though the Yukawa matrix is now diagonal. The CKM matrix appears here, and that uh, is not diagonal, at least not in general. And then we have QI bar left times phi times DRJ. And finally, minus YU IJ, that is again diagonal, QI bar L phi tilde. U, R, J, plus the Hermitian conjugate of the same thing. So that was our Yukawa Lagrangian, as, and as I said uh, already, so the Yukawa matrices are diagonal. The only thing where the generations are connected is the CKM matrix here, which has uh, potentially non-diagonal entries. Let us look now specifically at one of the terms, uh, because so far I've never really written out what the plus Hermitian conjugate is, but that is now important. So let me write down uh, the full expression for the leptons. So only the Ye term is now minus Ye ij l l i bar phi E R J minus Y E I J, and then the complex conjugate of this is simply for the spinors the reverse expression E R J bar times phi decker times L L I. Okay. That is the Hermitian conjugate, and here in order to make it really Hermitian, uh, I, in general, have to add the complex conjugated coupling constant. Then the right term is manifestly the Hermitian conjugate or complex conjugated version of the left. However, we have assumed that the Yukawa coupling for the lepton is real, then that wouldn't make a difference. But in general, this would be uh, the fully Hermitian combination of the two terms for the leptons. Now, what is now the impact of CP? Under CP, uh, how does this Lagrangian transform? We have seen how all the fermions transform. 
namely they basically become Hermitian conjugated. So in principle this term under CP just becomes that term. However, under CP the coupling constants are not affected. They are numbers and they commute with OCP operators. Therefore, only those terms here are um, behaving non-trivially under CP. And under CP, simply the two operator terms are exchanged and the coupling constants remain what they are. Therefore, under CP, simply L I L phi E R J is exchanged with this other term and therefore this Yukawa Lagrangian is invariant if all the couplings are real. So you see it from this example. This example term is CP invariant if and only if the coupling prefactors are real. And the same holds, of course, for all the terms. And uh, we have assumed that the coupling, Yukawa couplings, are actually real. So that is true. But for the CKM matrix, we have not yet assumed that it is real. And so therefore, it in the end boils down to the question uh, whether the CKM matrix is real or whether it has complex entries. If the CKM matrix is not real, then we have CP violation. So complex CKM matrix required for CP violation. Okay, so that is the big discovery. Uh, all the terms of the standard model Lagrangian are automatically invariant except for the one which involves the CKM matrix. And uh, so now we have to ask whether the CKM matrix is real. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we have to use some additional freedom to uh, change our fields and parameters by complex phases. So we can do, for example, uh, QLI is multiplied with a complex phase e to the i alpha i q l i. Okay. Suppose we do that, so each generation um, of this doublet is now multiplied with a complex phase. That is not a gauge transformation, it is just a real de redefinition of our quantum field operator by a complex phase. You know, typically the complex phases of these operators do not matter. But how does the Lagrangian change if we replace our field by a new field which uh, has such a phase? Then, again, all these uh, simple terms like kinetic terms and so on in the Lagrangian, they do not change at all because the phase drops out between Q dagger and Q. Uh, therefore, the only term which changes uh, is the Yukawa term. And here, basically, if QI is replaced by such a phase, then we can absorb the phase in the parameter. So such a change is equivalent to changing uh, the Yukawa matrices or the CKM matrix by a phase. And we can do the same for all the other fields. So we can do it for the right-handed quarks, let's say e to the i. Uh, beta i, uh, or let's do the same 
uh, alpha i u r i. So if we choose here the same phase, then we do not destroy the relationship that the uh, Yukawa couplings in the up quark sector have already been assumed real and positive. So if we would choose here a different phase for those two fields, then we would ruin our uh, already achieved, uh, let's say, a simple Yukawa structure. Uh, and then we would generate here a complex Yukawa coupling artificially out of a real Yukawa coupling. That wouldn't be good. So we want to make our Lagrangian simpler and not more complicated. Therefore, uh, let's keep the Yukawa coupling here what it was. It was already optimized in a sense. Therefore, we multiply those two fields with the same phase. Then the phase drops out here and the Yukawa coupling stays positive. But for the down quark fields, D, R, J, we uh, multiply with different phases. Then again, all the kinetic terms uh, do not change under this uh, phase transformation. But what changes is now the CKM matrix. So this change is equivalent to a change of the CKM matrix. So the entire replacement of the fields means that uh, the Lagrangian effectively changes such that uh, the Yukawa couplings for the leptons and the Yukawa couplings for the up quarks uh, remain. But the product of the CKM matrix times the down Yukawa coupling matrix element Ij changes with the phase e to the i, then minus alpha i plus beta j times itself. Okay, So you can change this product of matrices by uh, such complex phases. And actually, since the Yukawa matrix here is diagonal, that is simply equivalent to uh, the same change just for the CKM matrix. So CK matrix Ij goes into e to the i minus alpha i plus beta j uh, b ij. OK, so by using this, uh, what it means is that we can change the Lagrangian without changing the physics, because such field redefinitions do not change the physics. But uh, we can change the values of the parameters of the Lagrangian in this way. And we can simplify the structure of the, um, the parameters of the Lagrangian. So for example, we might use this opportunity to make the CKM matrix real, maybe, by uh, redefining it with such complex phases to make the matrix elements in the CKM matrix real. The question is, can we actually make it real by choosing those phases here in the appropriate way? It looks quite general, but you see that uh, we do not have as many phases available as there are matrix entries. For example, in three dimensions, it is a three by three matrix with nine entries. But here we have three plus three phases, which are six phases, uh, which can change the nine entries. And actually, only the differences between the six phases appear. So therefore, actually, there are five independent phases by which we can redefine the nine entries of the CKM matrix. So therefore, it's not obvious that we can make everything real. But that is what we can do. So we can remove some complex phases from the CKM matrix. without changing physics. So let's do that. And now comes into play the discussion of how many generations are there. And that was the big discovery of Kobayashi Maskawa.
for which they received also the Nobel Prize. Namely, they discovered that if we have three generations, then the CKM matrix has a complex entry which is physical and which cannot be redefined away by such a possibility. However, if we have two generations or one, then uh, without loss of generality, the CKM matrix is real. In other words, we need at least three generations in order to have CP violation in the standard model. Let's prove this. Let's say we have NG generations. Then the CKM matrix V is a general unitary matrix. How many real parameters does a general unitary matrix in n generations have in n by n matrix? It has n square real entries, n g square real parameters. Then we can redefine it in this way and uh, we have at our disposal n alphas and n betas, that means two n minus one differences. So we can remove two n g minus one phases by choosing these alphas and betas appropriately. And uh, then we can ask how many parameters remain. So n g square minus 2n minus uh, 1 is exactly n g minus 1 square parameters. Okay, so let's plug in some examples. So what happens if we would have only one single generation n g equal 1, one generation only? Then uh, you could go through the entire discussion once again from the beginning and obviously one would not need a CKM matrix but nevertheless the entire formalism uh, applies also to one generation and in that case the CKM matrix would now be a unitary one uh, times one matrix. Unitary one times one matrix is just one complex phase. Um, and uh, how many phases can we remove? We have one alpha and one beta at our disposal, one difference, so we can remove one phase. We have one phase minus one phase gives zero. So we have one minus one equal zero uh, parameters in uh, V uh, and therefore in particular no complex phase. And so that shows that for one generation, we can assume without loss of generality that the CKM matrix is real. And uh, combining it with everything else we said, it means that in one generation, the entire Lagrangian of the standard model has only real parameters, and then we have no CP violation. What happens for two generations? For two generations, uh, the CKM matrix would be a unitary two times two matrix. Um, and a two unitary two by two matrix has in general four real parameters, namely one mixing angle and three phases. Uh, so four parameters. And then we have at our disposal two alphas and two betas, in other words, three differences. So we can remove three phases from our four parameter unitary matrix. And so there remains one parameter in the CKM matrix after that redefinition. And uh, that means we can remove all the three complex phases out of the unitary two by two matrix. And what remains is a real two by two matrix, a real two by two matrix unitary is just an orthogonal matrix. So then V would look like this, cosine theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. So it's an orthogonal um, two by two matrix with one mixing angle theta, which uh, has a name. It is the so-called Kapipo angle, 
which was actually introduced in the standard model when people did not yet know about the third generation. So, so it's just an orthogonal two by two matrix instead of a general unitary two by two matrix because we can remove all the three complex phases. And so therefore we have no CP violation. Now finally, the case of nature, three generations, then uh, the three by three unitary matrix in general has nine real parameters. We have three alphas and three betas. In other words, we have five differences that we can use to uh, simplify the CKM matrix. And then there remain four parameters. In the CKM matrix after that simplification. And uh, does that mean we can uh, choose V real without loss of generality? No, it does not. Because uh, if we could choose it in a real way, then it would be an orthogonal matrix. An orthogonal matrix in three dimensions has three Euler angles, only three parameters. But we have actually four parameters. Therefore, there must be one complex parameter remaining inside of the CKM matrix. So, but uh, real unitary, that means orthogonal. Three by three matrix has only three parameters. And for this reason, there remains one complex phase. And that is the so-called CKM phase delta CKM. And so that means that if the standard model has three generations of quarks, then there is precisely one and only one parameter which corresponds to complex entries in the Yukawa Lagrangian, and that violates CP. And so therefore, the striking outcome of this analysis is that we have exactly one parameter which is responsible for the CP violating um, physics in the standard model. So since we have three generations, it means the standard model does predict CP violation. And all CP violating effects are related to one single parameter. Delta CKM. And that is, first of all, a very striking prediction. So there is not a lot of freedom. <coughs> and if you measure many different CP violating effects and observables, then they must all be related in the end to this single parameter. And that is, of course, a very non trivial statement. Very non trivial prediction, which uh, is tested experimentally. And so far, experiments have confirmed. Uh, this simple prediction. And uh, furthermore, the CKM phase appears inside of the CKM matrix. So therefore, it is connected to flavor physics. CP violation in the standard model is intimately connected to flavor physics. flavor transitions. So in particular, if you have a process 
where in principle the process could be mediated or could exist even if there would be only one generation, then uh, the, that process cannot feel the CP violation of the standard model. In order to be able for a process to feel CP violation, the process must somehow depend on all three generations simultaneously. Otherwise, you could always uh, forget about the other generations and uh, take a real CKM matrix, and then you wouldn't have a CP violating effect. So, and uh, since uh, it must feel all three generations simultaneously, it must basically feel all CKM matrix elements simultaneously. They must all simultaneously appear in the corresponding Feynman diagrams. Otherwise, you couldn't see the, CK, uh, the CP violation. And now you probably know that the CKM entries, the off-diagonal ones, they are very small. So if all of them simultaneously must appear in a Feynman diagram, then uh, you get a strong suppression, a strong numerical suppression, and the CP violating effect will be numerically suppressed. This is an important result uh, about CP violation in the standard model. Let me give you an example of a CP violating effect without calculation. Nowadays, CP violation has been measured in a large variety of observables. Um, and let me give you an example which is particularly easy to understand. Some other examples which are measured and which are important are a little bit uh, more complicated. But here is a simple one. There exists the k -on, which is a meson, a bound state of quarks involving the strange quark. And so there is a k-long which is the long lift k on, and that is equal to its own antiparticle. And uh, there is a decay mode, k long can decay into pi plus e minus and an antineutrino via the weak interactions. And this decay has a certain probability and a corresponding decay rate, gamma L. Or, well, let's call it gamma minus. Because we see in the final state a negatively charged electron. And so since this is equal to its own antiparticle, uh, it can also decay into the corresponding final state with antiparticles instead of particles. So there is also the decay k long going into pi minus e plus and neutrino. And that would have the rate gamma plus. And now the CP violation tells us that the two processes are not equally likely. They are connected by CP transformations, because if you do the CP transformation of one final state, you get the other final state. And uh, if you would have CP invariance, the two decay modes would have to be equally likely, but they are not. So the experiment tells us that the following ratio difference of the decay rates divided by the sum. So the relative difference, in other words, is 0 0.003, 3 per mil difference. And that is a direct observation of CP violation. And this direct observation exactly agrees with the prediction of the standard model involving the CKM phase. So 
So in fact, there are many such observables and they all agree with the standard model prediction based on this delta CKM. Okay, so that is a great success of the standard model and in a way it's one additional miracle that we have exactly the number of generations in our quarks which are needed to get CP violations. We do not have more than the bare minimum that is necessary, but we have exactly the minimum number of generations which can give CP violations and we do have CP violation and uh, the prediction agrees exactly with data. Having said all that, let me give you a remark which is a side topic. Namely, there could be a second source of CP violation in the standard model which you cannot see in Feynman diagrams but which is a non-perturbative effect. The so-called QCD theta term. So one could add a term to the Lagrangian L theta QCD which uh, looks like the following, some coefficient a times, or let's say, uh, a times epsilon tensor, epsilon mu nu rho sigma times uh, f mu nu f rho sigma for the QCD field strength tensor. This term is also gauge invariant. Uh, it's basically equivalent to uh, the product of the field strength times its dual field strength tensor. That is gauge invariant and also Lorentz invariant, but it violates CP because uh, under CP basically uh, the indices all behave in the obvious way, but uh, there are three spatial indices and one time-like index and therefore since the spatial indices change their sign under CP, uh, just the entire term changes its sign. Therefore it is not CP invariant. But uh, it is a total derivative Therefore, in perturbation theory, it cannot appear because there we drop total derivatives and in Feynman rules, it would correspond to a sum of incoming momenta, which is zero because of momentum conservation. Therefore, so it cannot appear in Feynman diagrams. And therefore, we have never written it down to begin with, even though we could have. Um, but if you go through the non-perturbative treatment of this term without using Feynman diagrams, then you discover that actually it can lead to um, CP violating effects. And those CP violating effects would have nothing to do with flavor and nothing to do with regenerations. And those CP violating effects which would come from this term are not observed. Therefore, experimentally we have found that the coefficient of this term is zero or if it's non-zero it must be extremely small because we do not see its effects. So let's simply say the corresponding CP violating effects are not observed. So it means the coefficient must be zero or very small and the experimental limits are around 10 to the minus 9. And so that is actually um, uh, one of the open questions of particle physics is the so-called theta QCD problem 
because people try to find a uh, reason why that term should be zero or why it should be extremely small such that we do not observe its effects even though in principle it could be there. But anyway, um, from the phenomenological point of view, it is correct to drop the term because we have not seen its effects. But uh, so just that you know that in principle such a term would exist. Any questions so far? That would basically uh, constitute our summary of CP violation and uh, then I would show you a little bit of example processes and then we wrap up our three-level discussion of the standard model such that next time we would start with um, higher order discussions of the standard model. Yeah, for example, it gives an unambiguous definition of meta versus antimeter that you can communicate to everywhere, like we can do with parity violation. And uh, so you can communicate by using parity violation to somebody uh, that you see only on the telephone what you mean by right-handed versus left-handed. Here you can also communicate electrons versus positrons in that way. Yes, right, exactly. And also you see that in, in uh, such a way from the CP violation uh, that is connected uh, in an interesting way to the baryon asymmetry in the universe because we ask ourselves where does the uh, baryon antibaryon asymmetry come from. There is more matter than antimatter in the universe. In particular there are more baryons than antibaryons in the universe. And uh, so uh, maybe that has some dynamical explanation. Maybe it's an accident, but maybe it has some dynamical explanation. And this could be such an explanation that in the early universe there were particles, maybe neutral particles, which decay more often into matter than antimatter. And then such an asymmetry could have been created. That is one of the possibilities. For I mean, kaons cannot be responsible if you look at the details that is known. So it is known that the CP violation that exists in the standard model is not enough to generate uh, the observed baryon antibaryon asymmetry, but similar uh, mechanisms, um, if they are present, for example, in the very, very early universe after inflation, coming from grand unified theories, for example, could hypothetically explain the baryon antibaryon asymmetry. Anyway, it is clear that for this asymmetry to be created dynamically, you need CP violation and you need a preference of meta versus antimatter in such a way. So this sort of thing would in fact be the simplest way, also the simplest uh, for conceptual understanding how the baryon asymmetry could be created. Because you see it directly. In the, in the early universe, you might have only neutral particles which are heavy, then they decay dominantly into matter, that's it. But uh, we don't know what is the correct explanation of this. Are there other questions? Okay, then let me give you um, one or two examples. Some sample processes. And uh, let me begin with a classic uh, flavor changing neutral current process. So for kaons. So for example, anti strange and down quark together, they form a bound state K0. Uh, the notation is historical and uh, uh, K0 was attributed to be a particle with so-called strangeness number one and strangeness number one corresponds to an anti-strange quark inside of the meson. So the 
got it uh, designed wrong somehow. But that is just a convention. So anyway, this has strangeness number one and it contains an S bar. And you can write down the following Feynman diagram, which is a one loop box diagram. And in the final state, you have an anti down and a strange. And so you see that here you have, for example, W bosons, W bosons. And here you have up quark, charm quark, or top quark, and here also up quark, charm quark, or um, top quark. And uh, then the charges are conserved at each vertex, but you convert a down quark into a strange quark and an anti strange into an anti down quark in this way. And so basically, you change the strangeness number by two units, and so this final state would be called K0 bar, and you have delta strangeness by uh, minus two in this way. And uh, this process generates a mixing K0, K0 bar mixing, which means that uh, those two mesons are actually not mass eigenstates, but some linear combination between them is a mass eigenstate. And uh, this effect can be observed. Or if you prepare a strangeness eigenstate like K0, K0, then uh, this mixing means that uh, there is an oscillation, like neutrino oscillations, where the state oscillates between pure K0 and pure K0 bar with a certain oscillation frequency. So that is one such flavor violating effects. Uh, effect. Let us sketch um, the quantitative prediction of the standard model. So this Feynman diagram contains the following important quantities without going into details of the calculations. But what are the key properties of the diagram? At each vertex, there is a CKM matrix element appearing because we have now W boson vertices with quarks and they depend precisely on the CKM elements. And so at each vertex there is either um, a CKM matrix element for a strange quark and the corresponding uptype quark. Let's say let's call this here I and let's call that here J. Then, for example, at this vertex, we get a CKM matrix element V, I, D. Then, uh, at this vertex, we get V star I, S. And at the other, we get similar things V, J, D times V, J, S complex conjugated. So we get a product of four different CKM matrix elements. Then what else do we get? Then we get um, a Feynman loop diagram. And in this closed loop, we get an integral over the momentum which flows through the loop. And uh, there will be some complicated integral. But at the end, the integral will have some result. And what will the result depend on? The result will in particular depend on the masses which appear in the loop. Which masses appear in the loop? So let's simply say loop function which depends on the masses. And it depends on the masses mi divided by mw and mj divided by mw. Okay, so it will depend on some uh, mass ratio of these particles. Now, without doing the calculation, how would such a loop function typically look like? We can uh, do a Taylor expansion in the small mass ratios because the W mass is uh, much bigger than the masses of the quark, except for the top quark. But since the top quark is so heavy, its contribution anyway is strongly suppressed. Therefore, the interesting cases are the light quarks. And then the mass ratio here is very small. And then we can approximate the loop function by a constant plus higher order terms in those small mass ratios. So typically, if you have some experience, you know 
that it will depend quadratically on the masses mi squared divided by mw squared plus mj squared divided by mw squared plus higher orders. And the constant term, which is not suppressed by uh, the mass ratios, will cannot depend on the indices because otherwise it would be suppressed. Okay, now from this simple sketch of the contributions, we can already draw a very important conclusion, which is uh, true in this process, but actually true in many processes like it. Namely, uh, in the standard model, such flavor changing neutral current processes are threefold suppressed. So there is not just one suppression, but there are three different suppression mechanisms at play simultaneously. And that means that all such processes are extremely small and have very small uh, probabilities in the standard model. So what are those three suppressions? The first suppression is of course that it's a loop process which appears at higher orders in Feynman diagrams. Why not at tree level? Because there is no tree level flavor changing neutral current in the standard model. That is what we proved. There are no flavor changing neutral current interactions because they drop out. So we need loops in order to have flavor changing neutral currents but loops are always suppressed by a loop factor 1 over 16 pi square, which is a percent. Okay. So automatically we get a percent level uh, prefactor, which suppresses this uh, flavor changing neutral currents only appear at higher orders in Feynman diagrams. Then the next suppression is uh, the CKM matrix. Of course, in order to generate flavor change neutral currents, you have here um, some CKM matrix element, for example, D goes to U and U goes to S. D goes to U is big, so that is first generation, first generation, but then you would have first generation, second generation, so an off diagonal entry, which is small. Or you could have D going to C, then you have sec first to second is small, C to S is large. But you always have at least one small factor from an off diagonal CKM matrix element. So, so the, the off diagonal elements are small. And that is actually um, simply an experimental observation. They wouldn't have to be small. It could be a matrix with very large off-diagonal entries from the theory point of view, but it isn't. It's just an experimental fact that the off-diagonal elements are small. But once we know about this, then we see that the flavor changing the currents are suppressed by here at least two powers of these small off-diagonal entries which comes on top of the loop suppression. And that is not even the end. There is a third suppression, which is the so-called Jim mechanism. Which comes from the behavior of the loop. If you look at the loop function, then you see here the following, the loop is multiplied with this product of four CKM matrices and then of course you get a sum over the index ij. What happens in this sum? In the sum you get here for example one term v i d times v star i s. What happens if you sum over i? What is this combination? This is of course a matrix multiplication. So sum over i. It's a matrix multiplication uh, of v times v dagger. But v is a unitary matrix. Therefore, if you do v times v dagger, it becomes the unit matrix. So if you extract the ds entry of the unit matrix, it gives zero. 
So the sum over i of this is zero. It's zero. What does that mean? So that is the unitarity of the CKM matrix. Where does this sum appear? Here the sum appears but times the loop function, but the loop function contains a constant term which doesn't depend on the masses. Therefore, the constant doesn't depend on the indices. So if you do this, then the constant term out of the loop function drops out. And then the only thing that remains are the higher order terms, and the higher order terms involve extremely small mass ratios of small quark masses divided by the heavy W mass. And then you have the third suppression. So therefore, the constant term drops out only m i or j square divided by m w square terms remain. These are the three suppressions and they are all independent of each other and they all come on top of each other and therefore such processes are extremely small and very much suppressed. And actually, uh, all of this was known very early on, in particular by Jim in the 1970s. And uh, they used that to predict the mass of the charm quark. Because uh, even before knowing about the charm quark, you can do this calculation. And you see then in the end, from this analysis, the dominant term will be the one with the highest quark mass which plays a role. And the highest quark mass which plays a role will appear as a quark mass square directly in the final prediction. Therefore, in the end, uh, the final prediction will be very strongly depending on the highest quark mass of relevance of the process. And therefore, uh, they can use this experimental result to predict that highest quark mass of relevance, which was the charm quark mass. And that prediction turned out to be correct. So these are the three suppressions of flavor changing neutral currents. Let me just give you a small example how else it could be. For example, beyond the standard model, there is the two Higgs doublet model, where you could have, for example, this Feynman diagram strange quark, down quark, then a new Higgs boson, uh, D, R, and S. And then if you have this new Higgs boson coming from the 2 x doublet model, this has or can have three-level flavor changing neutral currents. And then there might be simply those Feynman rules where the Higgs couples to down and strange quark immediately. And then there is no loop suppression. There is no CKM suppression because that is a different matrix which might have very large off-diagonal entries. And of course, there is no G mechanism. So all three suppressions are absent. So, but again, of course, the experiment agrees with the standard model, which has all those suppressions. What does this tell us about physics beyond the standard model? It tells us that such ideas are probably wrong. You cannot have new physics with such Higgs boson couplings, because that would uh, probably ruin the agreement with experiment, because it might give rise to a million times higher rates for such flavor changing neutral currents. Unless you make those couplings extremely small, and that is what you have to do if you consider such uh, extensions of the standard model. So again, this is something to keep in mind once you go beyond the standard model. Then let me also talk about CP violation a little bit. So surely this Feynman diagram would also correspond to the CP violation of kaons. So this uh, would generate the k-long mass eigenstate, which has then the CP violating decay. And you can see this is a Feynman diagram where actually all three generations simultaneously appear. 
because you have down and strange in the external lines and uh, first and second generation and in the loop there can appear the top quark. And so this is a diagram which can feel all three generations simultaneously. And therefore from such Feynman diagrams you can get CP violating effects. Um, and that is in line with what we said before. But let me now give you some uh, other example which is also interesting and important to know for current particle physics, namely electric dipole moments. Electric dipole moments. Electric dipole moments are quantities which are directly a CP violation, uh, violating. So let's say you have here the electric dipole moment of a fundamental particle. Uh, an electric dipole moment basically is a vector in uh, three space. It has a direction and a magnitude. And if you have a fundamental particle which might have an electric dipole moment, then the orientation of the dipole moment must be connected to the fundamental properties of the particles. But the particle has only one direction which is singled out and that is the spin. Therefore, if a fundamental particle has an electric dipole moment, this must be proportional to the spin of the particle. However, if you uh, do a time reversal, then under a time reversal, the spin becomes its negative because spin basically corresponds to a rotation. Um, and therefore, as a consequence, under time reversal, the electric dipole moment would also have to change its sign. However, uh, you measure an electric dipole moment by applying a homogeneous electric field. And under time reversal, homogeneous electric fields do not change their sign. Therefore, the interaction energy between the particle and the electric field changes its sign under time reversal. And that means the Hamiltonian for that particle is not invariant under time reversal. So, Hamiltonian. If the EDM is non-zero. And uh, from quantum field theory, without proof, we know that there is always CPT invariance. Hence, P violation is equivalent to CP violation. So therefore, electric dipole moments of fundamental particles like electron, proton, neutron, and so on are a sign of CP violation. Good. And these electric dipole moments are particularly interesting because they are observables which are directly a measure of CP violation, but they have nothing to do with flavor. So these are completely flavor independent observables for CP violation. And that makes them very interesting. And uh, there are many experiments searching for such electric dipole moments. And so, for example, one searches for EDMs of the electron of the neutron. The neutron is particularly good because it has no electric charge. But in principle, one could also search for the proton and also for the muon and, uh, and so on. And uh, so far, one has not seen experimentally uh, such an electric dipole moment.
But in principle, the standard model predicts that such electric dipole moments must be non-zero because obviously in the standard model we do have CP violation. But let us understand um, how big is the prediction of the standard model for these EDMs. And from what I said before, you should now understand in the standard model we need three generations in order to um, create CP violation but these are flavor independent observables. Therefore, you need Feynman diagrams to create electric dipole moments where all three generations appear simultaneously and those will be very complicated Feynman diagrams. So let me give you an example. For example, for the down quark, I uh, had here the following Feynman diagram. Uh, in the end, you need an interaction between the down quark and the photon which corresponds to an electric dipole moment interaction. And this can be done in the following way. Here the down quark comes in. Then you have a loop with a W boson and the charm quark, for example. Here the photon couples to this charm quark. Then it goes on. The charm quark could become, for example, a bottom quark. Then you have here another W boson. Here you could have the top quark and here again you have the down quark and in order to make it a one particle irreducible diagram you could have here for example a gluon exchanged between the charm quark and the top quark. And then you have a Feynman diagram with one, two, three loops and you have first generation, second generation, third generation of quarks simultaneously appearing. And it involves two powers of the strong gauge coupling and four powers of the weak gauge coupling. And it involves, of course, lots of off-diagonal CKM matrix elements. Basically, all off-diagonal CKM elements are simultaneously appearing. Therefore, this diagram is super suppressed. But from this Feynman diagram, one would get a prediction for a non-vanishing neutron or proton electric dipole moment. Similarly, for the electron, uh, you can do similar Feynman diagrams, but for the electron, you need that uh, maybe a four-loop diagram, because uh, first of all, from the electron, you need some couplings in order to make quarks appear. And then all three generations of quarks have to appear. So, uh, and you need external electrons. So basically you can attach something here with external electrons and then you get a um, uh, loop diagram for the electron EDM. So electron EDM at the four loop level. But again, for example, in the two Higgs doublet model, you might have simply such a Feynman diagram. Um, okay, uh, maybe. Or, um, yeah, how can you say, for example, supersymmetry. You could have this uh, electron, electron here, the superpartner of the electron, this electron, and here are some neutralino fermions superpartners of all the standard model fermions and here a photon. Then you have at the one loop level such a Feynman diagram which can give rise to CP violation. And uh, therefore again, extensions of the standard model can give predictions for electric dipole moments which are many, many orders of magnitude higher than the predictions of the standard model itself. And then you need to watch out that you do not break the agreement between standard model and experiment in this way. On the other hand, uh, this thing that you see that in principle other models um, easily predict uh, much larger electric dipole moments combined with the fact that we need to explain the baryon-antibaryon asymmetry of the universe where the standard model CP violation is not enough motivates searches for electric dipole moments. Maybe one will find uh, one such non-vanishing EDM 
which then inevitably would prove the existence of physics beyond the standard model in connection with CP violation and that would be a very important information in understanding, for example, cosmology. Therefore, those experiments are done and they are very interesting to observe. All right, let me finish the lecture by simply summarizing uh, the main properties of the standard model. And uh, either today or in the beginning of the next lecture, I will give a very brief summary of the Feynman rules, as I promised, and then we go on with higher orders. But let me uh, first show you a summary of the miracles of the standard model. So without much comment, so there was first automatic baryon and lepton number conservation. And remember that followed simply from the field content of the theory. Field content plus gauge invariance plus renormalizability. We obtained accidental baryon and lepton number conservation. Then the second is that we automatically um, break spontaneously as u2 left cross u1 hypercharge to u1 for the electric charge. And uh, here it is automatic that uh, after the Higgs acquires a vacuum expectation value, there will necessarily be an unbroken U1 gauge group. And this unbroken U1 gauge group necessarily is a linear combination of hypercharge with one of the SU2 generators. And without loss of generality, we can take it as hypercharge plus T3. And this is just our choice, but uh, it is automatic that there must be such a linear combination which remains unbroken. And that uh, followed from one single Higgs doublet with hypercharge equal to one half. Then the third miracle was um, the uh, three-level row, row three equal to one, or equivalently MW to MZ is equal to cosine theta, which is the same as GW divided by the square root. At three level, of course, and that followed from custodial symmetry. the uh, symmetry the standard model has on top of gauge invariance, namely an approximate SU2 left cross SU2 right, which is spontaneously broken to an SU2 custodial in the vacuum. Then, uh, regarding three generations, there is no three level flavor changing neutral current. Um, for example, in the Z and Higgs interactions. Whereas in extensions of the standard model, Z boson or Higgs interactions could easily have such flavor changing neutral currents. And uh, that, of course, has this impact here on flavor changing processes. So we have three suppressions. of flavor changing neutral current processes. Then we have just one single uh, source of CP violation. Del 
delta ckm. And uh, that corresponds to exactly three generations. And uh, this statement here ignores the theta parameter from QCD, which would be a second source of CP violation. But even including that, one would have precisely two parameters for all CP violating uh, observables. And then maybe I would like to add here a statement on neutrino masses. We didn't put in right-handed neutrinos into the standard model field content and then automatically the neutrinos are massless. So we have no neutrino masses. And since we didn't put in the right-handed neutrinos, that is an automatic consequence. So it's maybe not a miracle in the same sense. But what is interesting in this connection is that then at the dimension 5 operator level, there would be this single dimension 5 operator which would generate Majorana neutrino masses. And uh, so that could naturally explain why the neutrino masses are as small as they are. So it would provide a rationale for this observation. All right, so this is the list of miracles. I hope I didn't forget anything important. We have encountered them along the way while we discussed the standard model at three level, and that is why or this is one reason why I was quite explicit and extensive in our three-level discussion, because all those things here are um, noteworthy. They, of course, can get lost if you only look at the detail, uh, the technical stuff and uh, write down Feynman rules and so on, then you do not see this. But there is a lot of very interesting physics hidden in the technical details, and uh, which in particular becomes uh, prominent if you compare the standard model with its alternatives. And uh, so looking at this and uh, to the fact that the standard model agrees so well with experiment is indeed uh, quite uh, laudable that the standard model performs maybe better than its inventors could have ever dreamed. OK, so I think we are oh, good uh, question. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so if we would include this uh, into the Lagrangian from the beginning, then it would correspond to a non-renormalizable theory. Therefore, we do not include it. Um, but uh, there is this idea of so-called effective field theories where you study extensions of the standard model by incorporating uh, more and more higher dimensional operators, which one thinks could be generated by some other dynamical mechanism, which we don't know. Uh, for example, new physics at very high scale, um, supersymmetry, two Higgs doublets. Uh, if the supersymmetric particles or the new Higgses are very heavy, then we do not see them in experiments, but they could have some effect. And one can typically take into account the effects of heavy particles by adding new operators to the standard model Lagrangian. In fact, one can prove that this is the most general thing that those heavy particles can do uh, if we are only restricted to low energy observables. And uh, therefore, extending the standard model by all possible gauge invariant operators of higher dimensionality would be a very model independent approach to studying what kind of physics could be out there, even uh, if we do not know from which particles and which interactions it can come. And then these new operators are sorted according to their mass dimension. A dimension 5 operator uh, behaves like 1 over mass. Dimension 6 behaves like 1 over mass square and so on. So therefore, uh, you might expect on very general grounds that the first uh, effect of any new interaction that you would see beyond the standard model is an effect from dimension 5 operators. And there is just one single dimension 5 operator, which is gauge invariant, and that is the one given neutrino masses. And so it is very natural to think that actually some 
unknown, but nevertheless some uh, non-vanishing interactions from heavy particles are responsible for generating the neutrino masses and then you would kind of quite naturally understand why the neutrino masses are very small because they involve this one over mass suppression and also why you do not see any other deviations from the standard model because all other deviations would be suppressed by an additional power of a heavy mass. So the effects would be much smaller than the small neutrino masses. So that is a very natural and uh, motivated way to think about this. However, it doesn't guarantee that it's the right way to think about it. This would give rise to Majorana neutrino masses, but we don't know. The neutrino masses could also be Dirac masses. And therefore, it's important to figure out what is the nature of neutrino masses in order to know how to extend the standard model in this context, for example. Other questions? Yes. Then let us stop here. In the afternoon we have exercise and next week I will uh, summarize the Feynman rules and then we do loop calculations and renormalization. Okay.